Good morning and welcome to United Way for Southeastern Michigan's virtual town hall. Uh, my name is Audrey Walker and today we will be joined by Shannon Garrett of the Michigan Women's Commission to hear about the work the Commission is doing. The last 10 minutes of today's town hall are reserved for questions. So please leave your questions in the Q&A box if you're watching on Zoom or in the comment box on Facebook. Now I would like to give a warm welcome to United Way's President and CEO, Dr. Darian Hudson, to say a few words. Thank you, Audrey, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our weekly virtual town hall. Uh, before the pandemic, we knew that 40% of our households were struggling to meet their most basic needs. And now uh, more than ever, we have families uh, that are really finding it difficult to put food on the table, to pay rent, uh, to find uh, affordable childcare uh, during this time of crisis. And unfortunately for women in our state, uh, they're facing even greater barriers to financial stability from inequities and in pay and advancement to struggling to find or afford uh, child care. The women's the Michigan Women's Commission is working to address these barriers that impact women across our state. We are excited to be joined today by Shannon Garrett, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Michigan Women's Commission. Shannon is a nationally recognized trainer, strategist, and leadership coach. As co-founder and board member of Vote Run lead, Shannon has helped train women to run for political office, breaking barriers along the way, and we thank you so much for that, Shannon. She is committed to advancing equity and inclusion in civic life and has worked alongside thousands of candidates, elected officials, social activists, and civic-minded organizations. Shannon is the co-founder and president of SMG Strategies, and she prioritizes intentionally and directly addressing the impact of intersectionality on political leadership in order to welcome more individuals into the civic space and strengthen our democracy and civic institutions. Please join me in welcoming Shannon Garrett, our Chief Strategy Officer for the Michigan Women's Commission, to speak with us today. And if I could just say, um, just a point of podium privilege, Shannon, how much I appreciate what you're doing for women across our state. We need as many advocates uh, as possible. And so I'm very eager to hear from you personally and professionally, I'm looking forward to ways that we can continue to lift the work uh, that you're doing for so many uh, in the state of Michigan. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me here today. Um, United Way is doing incredible work, uh, uh, not only in your region, but around the state. So we appreciate the work that you're doing and this opportunity to speak with uh, your audience. So thank you. Um, so I think I'll get started by maybe reintroducing or introducing the Michigan Women's Commission to folks. Um, the Michigan Women's Commission is a state of Michigan commission, uh, so it rests within the government. It was created by statute in 1968, uh, so kind of an early uh, adopter of looking at women's issues specifically from a state level. Uh, the statute, create, statute created the commission with 15 commissioners who are all appointed by the governor. Uh, they serve three-year terms, and so they're staggered five at a time. Uh, so at this point, uh, in Governor Whitmer's administration, she has appointed 10 uh, commissioners, and we have five who were appointed by the previous administration who are continuing to serve with us here. Uh, the duties that are laid out in the statute for the commission are to um, consistently review the status of women in the state of Michigan uh, and to draw attention to the critical problems that women face in this state, uh, recommend ways for us to overcome discrimination uh, and, and other harms that we face, uh, to conduct surveys and to recognize women's accomplishments and contributions to the state of Michigan. Um, so we are all about the ladies, <laughs> the Michigan Women's Commission. Uh, and um, we have four public meetings every year uh, where the commissioners come together. Generally, we try to do them in person and move them around the state. Obviously, everything's online right now, uh, which I think, frankly, for women and the women that we serve is actually better that we're online because it's allowing more people to participate in these public meetings. Uh, and in fact, the next meeting is coming up on Tuesday, October 6th at one o'clock. Uh, it will be streamed live to our Facebook page. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, on the YouTube channel uh, and Zoom and all of that. 
Uh, so if you check out our website later today, um, you'll see the links there for that. Uh, and uh, the public notice is out there. Every public meeting, we have uh, an opportunity for public comment, just like every other government agency. So if there are things that you hear come up during our meeting or issues that you uh, would like us to be looking at more closely, you are welcome to submit comments either in writing in advance or during the open uh, comment period during the meeting. So um, I look forward to seeing some of you on October 6th. Uh, so we have our 15 commissioners. They're from all over the state. You can uh, see all of their names and their uh, brilliant accomplishments uh, and the work that they're doing in their own professional and personal lives on our website. Um, we have a mighty staff of two people <laughs> to help do all this work. So there is Cheryl Bergman, the executive director, who is uh, uh, appointed to the position by the governor. Uh, and then we have me uh, as the chief strategy officer who is helping uh, walk alongside Cheryl and take all of these great ideas that are coming from the women of Michigan and from our commissioners and help sort of funnel them into some policy recommendations and actions that we can do to help um, further equity in the state. We are currently housed uh, within the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. We are an independent commission that reports directly to the governor, but we're housed uh, for budgetary purposes under the Department of Civil Rights. Uh, however, last month, Governor Whitmer announced that due to the priorities that we are working on as a commission right now, she is moving the Michigan Women's Commission to uh, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunities. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that is uh, in a moment, but it's largely because the things that we are working on um, are primarily economic justice issues for women in the state of Michigan. And so it made more sense to us for us to be working side by side with the folks over at Leo. Um, so that's the general nutshell of, of what the Michigan Women's Commission is. We are here to help advocate on behalf of the women of Michigan to find out what uh, challenges you're facing and how we as a, a commission can help move things forward to, to make things better. Um, so one of the first things that uh, the executive director, Cheryl Bergman, did when she um, was appointed by the governor, the governor said, I want to hear directly from women what are, the, what are the challenges out there right now? And so the commission developed a series of gender equity conversations. And we went around the state um, and held these uh, interactive conversations with about 100 to 150 women uh, in regions throughout the state. Uh, we did six of them before um, the pandemic uh, made us stop. Uh, so we were in Genesee County, Grand Traverse County, Kent County, uh, Oakland County, Wayne County, and Washtenaw County. Uh, so we, we tried to get around the state. Um, we put together planning teams for local planning teams for these regional conversations to make sure that we curated an invitation list to the conversation that included women representing the, the sort of broad and deep diversity of experience, uh, experiences of women living in that region so that we could make sure that we were hearing um, from as many people as, as we could. Um, and unfortunately, we had to stop doing those because of the pandemic, but we're hoping to continue with that as we move forward. Um, so in the meantime, what we did as a commission was we came together uh, in March, right before the shutdown happened, to do our strategic planning retreat. Um, and that's because at these conversations, uh, they were facilitated by usually a local facilitator um, who worked with the women in the room at tables um, to answer three main questions. Uh, what is the greatest challenge um, to achieving gender equity in this region? And we just brainstormed all the answers. Uh, what, is, what would be different if gender equity was achieved here in this region? So what would that look like? And then third, what are the key actions or the next steps that need to happen in order for us to get closer uh, to achieving gender equity? Uh, and then once we finished that final round, uh, we had some voting happening. So folks could go um, up in the room, could go and vote on what they thought the top four things were that, they, that we should be working on. And then the governor attended every one of these conversations. Um, and so while she was speaking, we would uh, be in the back tallying up what the women in the room had voted on as the top priorities. 
And once the governor wrapped, we would report out what that room of women had said. Here are the top things you as the governor, you as the Women's Commission should be working on so that we can achieve gender equity in this, um, in this region. And so the governor received all of those. She's already taken action on some of them. Um, and consistently across the board, every region that we were in, we were hearing the same thing. Childcare, pay equity, access to better jobs, uh, higher paying jobs, uh, more visible leadership roles across the board and across the sector. Uh, and through everything, there was uh, the need, addressing the need to address uh, implicit bias and systemic racism as it presents itself in policymaking. And so we took that as a commission, got together in our strategic planning retreat, took a look at everything, decided what we were gonna work on as priorities, and then voted on those in May. Uh, at our May meeting. And from that, we've developed four committees that we're, we now have. Um, we have the, <coughs> excuse me, Financial Freedom Committee that is working on ways to help women access greater wealth and accumulate greater wealth. So um, trying to figure out ways that we can solve the, the pay equity, the pay gap. Um, how can we help women get into the pipeline for those higher paying jobs, whether that's through um, access to programs like the new Futures for Frontliners programs or, or college degree and apprenticeship and certification programs, um, or how once you're in a position, how can we help you move up that ladder? Um, we as a state, that is. Uh, and then the second committee is our Visible Authentic Leadership Committee. And that is where we are working on how can we get more women leading with their full authentic selves in a public way um, at the tables where decisions are being made. And that committee has actually broken itself into two subcommittees. So we have one concentrating on how do we get more women and CEO roles uh, in the C-suites and businesses as the leaders of nonprofits, as the leaders of um, foundations who are making the decisions about where funding is going to solve problems locally. Uh, and then the other subcommittee within that is uh, working on women in elected leadership and how do we um, encourage more women to run for office at all levels of government. Uh, and one of the ways that we're looking at doing that is there's no real tracking in the state of Michigan for women in elected office at the local level. We can see how many women obviously serve in statewide office, like our governor, attorney general, secretary of state. Uh, we can see in the, the legislative level, but no one's really tracking the county, government, cities, townships, school boards, all of that. And we want to be able to see where are there some gaps. Um, and as you could tell from my introduction, this is a personal passion of mine is to, uh, is to solve this problem. I, I honestly believe that if we had more women at the table in all levels of government, we would be solving more of these problems. So we can save the politics for another time. but. I do think that um, it is important and I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity uh, on, in a public forum to say, if you are watching this, you are somebody who obviously cares about your community, you care about what's happening in the world, and you should consider uh, running for office at some point in your lifetime, whether that's locally, um, statewide, or, or nationally. So um, be sure to do that. So that's our, our vote for our Visible Authentic Leadership Committee. Our third committee is the Unlocking Opportunities Committee. And that's where we put all of the things that women told us were barriers to achieving their full economic freedom. Um, so what are the things that are preventing women from going after um, what they want in this world and achieving their dreams? Uh, and that's where we're working right now on childcare as the number one thing. Uh, so childcare is often a barrier that prevents women um, from, from going after the positions that they want, the hours that they want, um, you know, the career that they've, they've sought. Um, we're also taking a look at paid parental leave um, and how we can expand that in ways, um, similar to how the governor has done that uh, for the state of Michigan. Um, employees, we wanna be able to make that a model for, for other, um, other businesses and industries around the state. Um, and then we'll be looking at some of the other barriers, but right now childcare seems to be the thing. Uh, and I'll talk about what we're doing there in a second. Um, and then our fourth committee is really an overarching um, oversight committee. Oversight's not really the right word, but it is our committee on implicit bias. And that's where we're trying to do three things. 
Uh, one is we as a commission, the commissioners and staff and our team of interns that are helping us out, are doing our own work, doing our own trainings uh, to try to recognize implicit bias in ourselves and the way that plays out not only in our own life, in our own work, but as commissioners um, so that we can make sure that we are consistently um, centralizing the most marginalized populations as we're making recommendations so that we can make sure that, um, that we, are, we are doing what we've been called to do um, by the women of the state. Uh, the second thing is that um, to the extent that we are able to, um, making those learning opportunities public and sharing those with others. And so we've been doing right now, um, we just wrapped our second round of learning cohorts through the Michigan Women's Commission in partnership with the Michigan League for Public Policy. Um, they uh, um, partnered with us to let us use their 21 day racial equity challenge, uh, which we used and have adapted to add in person online um, cohort meetups. And so the 21 day challenge for those of you who are not familiar is every day for 21 days straight, you receive an email that has a learning opportunity about um, um, implicit bias and racial justice. Uh, and there's reflection points along the way. And we decided, based largely on the conversations that we've been having through the gender equity conversations, is that women wanted more opportunity to do this type of work together. Um, so we've added every seventh day an online learning opportunity with your cohort. So uh, every seventh day, the women in your group, mostly women, um, uh, there's, we're limited to 25, uh, get together online and talk about what they learned last week. What did they recognize? in themselves, what are they doing differently? Um, we use some of the questions that the, the league offers in their reflections, um, but we wanted to do it in person. And because that uh, had, has gone so well, and the response to that has been, you know, we wanna continue doing this, we now um, offer the fourth day um, of the month uh, cohort catch-ups. So we have a Monday cohort, or a Tuesday cohort in the evening, a Wednesday lunch co cohort and a Friday morning cohort. Uh, and now the fourth Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, anyone who's been a part of the 21 day challenge at any day is welcome to join together to sort of talk about how are you continuing to learn? What new resources um, have you run across? What challenges have you faced in trying to practice this in your own life? And how can we, how can we be better about it? So. That's one of the big things that we're doing right now. That cohort just wrapped, so we'll probably launch a new co cohort, I'm guessing, in February. Um, but in the meantime, if you wanna uh, click on the link uh, that was just put in the chat box, you can sign up for our waiting list and we can let you know. Uh, as soon as we open those cohorts, we'll let our waiting list know first because they have closed, filled up pretty quickly, so. Um, Shannon, thank you so much for sharing all this awesome information, um, definitely opening up my eyes and I'm sure everybody else's to all the wonderful work that you're doing um, here for women in our state, very important work um, as well. And um, I just wanted to uh, get some questions out there to you, yeah. um, especially based on some of the things that you brought up. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned that the, um, the Women's Commission is now part of the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. How does the Women's Commission plan to leverage your new placement within that? We plan to be working together on real policy solutions <laughs> to a lot of the issues. And so um, one of the main ways uh, right now is we have this child care use survey that we've launched, uh, which I think the link was just put in the chat box, where we are trying to survey parents out there, families, to find out what are you doing currently um, how are you handling child care during this pandemic? What do you need to happen to use child care outside of your home? And what does ideal child care look like for you post pandemic? Uh, so we're collecting that sort of information because that's one of the gaps that we saw in all of the other departments that are looking at child care from maybe an employer perspective or the child care provider perspective. We will be adding the voice of uh, mostly women on the ground who are dealing with child care on a day to day basis. And so being able to come together. Um, with the other parts uh, um, of, of LEO, uh, the Department of Labor, um, and other agencies in the state to say, okay, this is great, we all need to be looking at this, but let's make sure we're constantly lifting up 
the consumer when it comes to childcare. What are the actual needs? There's not a one size fit all, um, one size fits all response. So. Are you seeing um, similarities uh, that people are experiencing around the state? Is there anything that's specifically standing out around childcare? Child yeah. Um, yes and no. I mean, it really is all over the board at this point um, in how people are handling childcare right now. I mean, everybody is doing the best they can. It varies depending on um, whether or not your school is open for your school age children in person. Um, it depends on whether or not you have the ability to work from home uh, or work flexible hours, uh, you and or your significant other um, or partner in the raising of children. Um, we are seeing, uh, at this point, we've had about 500 responses so far. We're looking for more, so please um, respond. Um, but we are seeing that there is most of the time during the pandemic, people would like to be caring for their children themselves or through friends and family. But post pandemic, they're looking at uh, child care centers, in home centers, as well as friends and family. Um, and so there is this sort of while things are still in flux with the pandemic, we want to be at home if we can, um, doing this with our kids. Uh, and then once we're through this, we would like the opportunity to have some accessible childcare. And with um, kind of speaking to childcare, but also something else you pointed out earlier, um, you know, what, what is the current state and employer provided paid leave programs and how does access or lack of access to these paid leave programs affect women and their families? I almost see that going hand in hand a little bit. Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've been looking and looking and no one has done any sort of surveys or collection of what paid policies are um, at the business level around the state. Um, so we know obviously what the government does. Um, we know what the recommendations are. We know what the policies are for large organizations that have made that public. Um, so one of the things that the financial freedom or uh, uh, unlocking opportunities group is going to be looking at is how do we actually find out what's happening uh, on the ground at the variety of employment types. So the larger a business is, the larger a corporation is, um, the more likely they are to have something that's a, a you know better or I wouldn't say top notch, but getting top notch um, parental leave policy because it's attracting talent and they want to be able to attract talent. They know that part of that for both male and female employees is having uh, paid, you know, generous parental leave policies. Um, but what does that also mean for the, the, the clerk working at Meyer um, or the server at your local restaurant? And how do we, how do we find out what's happening for them? Um, and then how do we create policies that will help encourage that? Yeah, and with um, kind of with your talk about elevating talent and attracting talent too, you know, what else do you think needs to change in order to elevate more women into our business and nonprofit leadership roles? I think that the people currently in leadership do need to take an intentional approach um, to looking at how, um, not only how they are promoting people within their uh, within their business, within their um, employees, but how are they um, how are they addressing the different challenges that face each employee? Um, and so when you look at who is available to attend all of the sort of not official professional gatherings, but the professional gatherings where people network, where people make those introductions, where you get your face seen, how are you accommodating everyone in your ranks to be able to take advantage of those, knowing that we have a number of other responsibilities in our lives? And so um, I do think that this, um, in the business professional sense, this time right now where we're doing a lot of remote working, a lot of um, video conferencing, I think it is showing that there's opportunities for creative ways of including your employees um, actively and being able to help elevate them. Um, so I think that's one way. I think another way is this concept of sponsorship, um, not necessarily mentorship. We've been talking about mentorship for years and having someone tell you what you should do is great. Um, but we also just need to take someone under our wing and help make those introductions. And so 
when you are in leadership in any you know, industry or any sector, um, when you are finding those women that you think, you know, she's got what it takes, she's who I want to uh, help elevate, um, or looking around the room, you know, bring them along with you to the meetings, invite them to the, the meetings that they don't necessarily have to be at because it's not part of their job duty, um, but having her voice there, having her experience there, having her expertise in the room um, would, would be beneficial and it would also help her um, elevate her status. Um, I also think we need to stop and look who's in the room. And if we're not seeing a diverse representation of life experiences in the room, then we need to intentionally go out and look for that. And the last thing I would say is that we need to be better about labeling the expertise that women bring to the table. So there's the stuff that we went to school for maybe, or the job that we've been doing for 20 years maybe, but there's also a variety of life experiences that we have that make us experts. So when your HR department is looking at your leave policy or things like that, why don't you talk to the parents <laughs> that are in your, um, in your ranks um, and, and doing things like that. There's a number of women that are out there raising money, saving schools, putting together playgrounds. Right now they're keeping kids educated in a variety of ways. So let's make sure their voices are at the table when we're making decisions. I love that. I got goosebumps when you said that, just talking about labeling expertise and thinking about it in a different way. It's so um, important. We do have a couple minutes left and I kind of wanted to go back a little bit to the um, child care centers and, and, and a different question around child care um, is more the center. So, um, you know, the centers are seeing less people interact and utilize um, their services right now based on everything going on. Are there any sort of grants that are applying to that? Are there any sort of results you're seeing from these surveys that acknowledge this and can help? Yeah, definitely one of the things that we're seeing in the survey about um, why people are not sending their kids back right now is because you know a lot of it's I'm waiting for a vaccine. Some of it's, um, you know, we couldn't afford it because, you know, our kids, our elementary school kids, um, that's an expense that we weren't budgeting for. Um, maybe for our infant child, we were budgeting for childcare full time, five days a week, um, but our, our elementary school kids, we weren't. Um, so there's a variety of, of factors that are at play right now, and most of them are pandemic related and the work, um, work situations that are coming from that, work and school. Um, we are also looking at uh, and actually having conversations within Leo already about looking at how do we create more childcare um, and how do we make childcare a profession that you can actually, you know, live, make a living wage at at least, um, if not more, um, so that we can encourage more people to go into this um, and to value childcare as a career and as a public good um, that we should be holding to the same standards that we have for our schools uh, and our nursing care and senior centers. We wanna make sure that um, childcare is taken just as seriously because these are the most um, earning productive potential years for the parents. And so if we can't have them in the workforce, um, we're losing talent, we're losing dollars, um, we're losing income that could be then spent in other ways in our communities. Definitely goes hand in hand, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, we've we've only got time just for, for some closing thoughts from you. I'm just curious if there's anything that you feel like is super important that we need to know um, right now that you'd like to close us out with here. Yeah, I think just a couple of quick things. One, just to reiterate, fill out that census because that's going to make a big difference for all of us. Uh, vote in this election uh, because and when you're voting, vote with your your mom hat on, your woman hat on, your, you know, your family hat on. Uh, and then if you could fill out our survey, our child care use survey, that would be a huge help to us. Uh, and we can share that information back with you. But I just would like to leave it with the Women's Commission is your commission. Uh, so if you have concerns, if you have questions, if you're looking for resources, we might not have them at the commission, but we can certainly help point you in the right direction. Um, where, where you can find some help in the government and um, outside of it. Appreciate that. Thanks so much. I'm now going to turn it back over to Dr. Hudson. 
Thank you, Audrey. And thank you so much, Shannon, uh, for this helpful information. Uh, I wanted to also stress um, that while this is our commission, we also need men to pay attention to what's coming out of this commission and continue to advocate uh, for us as well. Um, it really is going to take all of us uh, to be able to address a number of the inequities that have been uh, impacting women for so long. And so just so pleased with the information you shared with us today. Uh, in terms of the early childhood work, we did, uh, there were a few other questions from people who are running centers and things of that nature. So we'll make sure um, on our pages that we have links um, also um, to your website specifically in this space uh, for child care and early child care, because uh, there's quite a bit that we're trying to do to make sure that uh, we're getting our, our um, associates licensed, uh, that we're helping to offset those costs, uh, as well as having those mentoring opportunities uh, with women in the field uh, to help continue to bring up uh, the next generation of leaders. So uh, such a treat to have you here with us today. Um, I know we're right at our time. So just very quickly, uh, Shannon reminded everybody, get that census done, make sure you're registered and ready to vote by November 3rd. Uh, and also, um, if you need help, if you're listening to this and, and you need further assistance, uh, please make sure that you call 211. You can also go to our website, unitedwaysem.org slash 211. These are resources that are available to you 24 seven. And one phone call will connect you to over 1300 social service agencies uh, and nonprofits in our region. So um, we are still operating. Uh, we've never stopped um, pre or during uh, the height of the pandemic. And so we are still available to support um, all of your needs. Uh, and then lastly, just your continued advocacy uh, around the COVID relief efforts are more necessary than ever. Um, we are in a situation uh, where uh, we still don't have um, all of the uh, relief bills um, that, that are needed and signed off on. And so if you could please go to standwithunitedway.org. Uh, make sure that um, you're calling your uh, local Congress representative uh, and making sure they know what you need uh, and they're hearing from you in terms of, way, in terms of ways that they can support uh, Michiganders uh, during this unprecedented time. Um, the census website is here for you. It's my2020census.gov. That's where you'll find out everything uh, that you need to know in order to be counted uh, for, this, uh, for this census for the next 10 years. And so with that, I uh, just wanted to announce uh, our next town hall. Um, we will be talking about equity quite a bit. Um, this is not a fad. Uh, this really is our way of doing business uh, and is definitely our pathway forward. And so we will be talking about equity and education funding. Our guest speaker will be Mary Greck, who is the senior data and policy analyst from the Education Trust Midwest. And that is scheduled for Wednesday, October 7th at 10 a.m. You can also receive alerts. Uh, for future town halls at www.unitedwaysem.org slash virtual town halls. So with that, thank you so much. Be well uh, and be safe, be healthy, and continue to stand united.